and start and start the process. Well, because of the Shark Tank love, I, um, you know, I got put on this uh, public pedestal where, you know, people started to understand that, you know, as a people started to understand that kind of that Shark Tank carpet, that entrepreneur that stands on that carpet. Uh, it, it doesn't discriminate against uh, creed, color, religion, sex, you know, you, it's the ultimate equalizer, right? That, that empowerment is the ultimate equalizer, and no matter who you are, and this is a great country that we live in, you have a shot. And with that acknowledgement, I was, uh, I was appointed as a presidential ambassador of global entrepreneurship, a page ambassador by President Obama in the White House, and uh, I'm one of several. People such as uh, Tory Burch and Steve Case are on there, and um, I, I had the privilege of uh, going to uh, Kenya with uh, the president and, uh, and, and the White House, and, and visiting Kenya and spreading the word of entrepreneurship, of how it can empower you and it can it can it can uh, help you feed your family and help you. Uh, you know, empower others when, you know, this unfortunate world we live in, when you don't have hope, other people tend to thrive off of that and ask you to, to be part of whatever their cause is and you, you feel that that's the only hope you have. But if now you know you can have a smartphone, you can open up a smartphone and make a couple of dollars and you can hopefully feed your husband, wife, kids and empower yourself, you're less likely to go and do some things that aren't in the best interest of uh, humans. You know, I mean, mankind. That by far would be my mother. Um, you know, I never, I never realized the lessons that she taught me until I ended up becoming, you know, a parent myself and realizing that I ended up following all the steps or all the mistakes I made, many of the mistakes I made, my mother had, had, had advised me that those were going to be mistakes, but she never uh, stopped me from going down the path because she wanted me to make those mistakes on my own and learn. Um, so she's always been uh, the number one important mentor that I've ever had. And then, you know, life is a series of mentors. I went on from there and, you know, I had one great teacher and that's all you need is one really great teacher in school that makes you feel really special. And then I had a a mentor who owned a, a corner store in my neighborhood and, and he would teach me and, and explain to me, you know, his business tactics. And then my mother <clears throat> ended up having a boyfriend who I call my stepfather, who um, who was actually of the Jewish faith. And, you know, he, he taught me that love doesn't come in a, a, in a color or a gender and that and that, um, you know, for me to be very proud of my culture, but don't be anti anything else and respect everybody. So I, I think that gave me a, a broader look at life. And I never walked in the room with a chip on my shoulder. I also never thought anybody else was better than me, but I never thought anybody had it better than me, too, because people of all colors uh, have challenges in life, dreams and aspirations. So those things all led me, uh, you know, to be the man that I am. And I'm, I'm very happy of those experiences. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it was this um, new music that was coming out of the Bronx right around 1982, 83. It was called, uh, you know, rap music. And it, it made its way into Queens where I lived. And this music was amazing. It was fascinating. You know, before that, I would listen to music, uh, you know, great, great people like, of course, you know, rest in peace, David Bowie and and Rolling Stones and Donna Summer, Stevie Wonder, Barry White. But all these people had this beautiful way of singing. They had this orchestra and everything else. Uh, and they, they touched on some of the political issues in the world. But this music that was coming out of uh, the Bronx uh, named Rap, it was kind of like our version of Twitter today, I always say. It was like a disruptive technology because I started to hear about other kids their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations, the plights of the neighborhood, things that I wouldn't be able to see on the news. And they were putting it in a rhythmic form and uh, it was starting to educate us and it came with a way not only to to listen to music but a way to walk, talk and even dress. Yeah. And you felt like you were part of this society if you wore your Adidas with fat laces on or you knew how to break dance. And, and, and that's where I sort of find my identity as a young man. Uh, so uh, that, that's really where fashion started right, right. Um, with me. 
I wouldn't know till you know I was about 12 years old uh, I wouldn't know till probably about another 10 years 15 years that maybe we should all do something uh, that we love right I tried everything else yeah. but I never thought about fashion it's kind of like you know you bust your butt to go uh, and, and and work and make a living and then you go out and at the, on the weekends you kind of snowboard and do all stuff like that, but you never thought about busting your butt building snowboard yeah, yeah. or 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 yeah or right, snowboarding right. and making money. I, I you know what it, again it, like like most of us start there was no belief that I could do it, but I remember walking into a store and um, I started to see cross colors everywhere. And then I walked in the store and I saw this picture of this guy who like looked like a young Mike Tyson hanging off a pair of jeans and it was uh, Carl Kanai. And then it just hit me. I thought prior to that, we always thought that you had to be from Italy and France to design. You had to be older and like a, you know, you know, the, the guys with the, with the tape around their neck, you know, the, the tailors, right? Sure, sure. And so, or, or whatever the fashion design had looked like in those days. And I thought, I just, I'm just supposed to buy from them. When I saw that, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Uh, then I'm watching a De La Soul video, I remember, and seeing them wearing these hats. It almost looked like a ski cap, but it has like a tie on the top, and I couldn't find that hat uh, anywhere in Queens. I finally find one uptown Manhattan. I, I pay for the, the hat. I come home. I show my mother. I say, look, Ma, I, you know, I, I, I paid, uh, you know, I always say a joke. I paid 6000 gas, $900 in tolls, and $20 for the hat. Check this out. And she goes, that's a piece of crap. But I can, Damon, I can show you how to sew hats like that so you can sew as many as you want so you can wear them. You don't have to do that. So go get $40 worth of fabric. I go to the store. Get $40 worth of fabric. I come home. I give my mother the the, the stuff the, to sew the hats. And she says, I'm not sewing this. You're sewing this. <laughs> I sew. Crap. Now I got to work at this. I sew the hats. And then all of a sudden, I have all these hats and only one head. Because right. it's not like I was too stupid or I wasn't thinking. Thank God. I didn't buy uh, forty dollars worth of different fabric. I put <laughs> forty dollars worth of the same fabric. Yeah, one maybe every three years. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. so anyway, so that, that's when it happened. That's when I went out and sold yeah. those hats in the outside on that Good Friday, and I sold eight hundred dollars of worth of hats in one hour. Wow. And that's when it just snapped. It just I just said to myself, wait a minute. I made this with my own hands. I went and sold this to individuals and nobody was in my way. I didn't have to get a check from a boss. Nobody told me when or to come to work or go to work. I can't get fired from this because of my color creed or whatever the case is. I'm responsible for what's happening here yeah. and I will either fail because every decision I make or I'll succeed because every decision I make. No, 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 no. I made money on my own and lost money on my own as an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I started my first business. It took me a long time to really decide what I want to do and what was my first business. It took me forever to decide my first business. My first business, I finally decided what I wanted to do when I was six years old. Wow. It took me forever, okay. right? <laughs> I was uh, selling pencils in, in school. Wow. Uh, and then I would... Then I would go ahead and, and, and sell candy. And then when, I, when, when, when it snowed, I would shovel snow in the winter, rake leaves in the, in the fall. And, and then I remember when I used to shovel snow, I used to go and kids would want to help me because I started getting you know everybody in the blocks that I wanted to. I would travel about three miles and, and take care of it. Kids would want to help me, so I would tell them, okay, no problem. Here's what you're going to do. If you're going to help me, I'm going to let you work. I'm going to give you a couple, let's split the money with you. But you got to do a, a spring cleanup for free so we can go back into spring. And then I would go to the to the owners of the house and say, well, everybody else on the block, if you shove, if they shovel your snow, they're charging you $3. If I shovel your snow three times during the, the winter, I'm going to give you a, a, a free spring cleanup. Mm. So I was leveraging all those little guys <laughs> in the neighborhood. Anything in business, it was always uh, a dry spell here, a dry spell there. But in all reality, you know, my friends and I, we love selling the hats. Why? Because there was a reason to talk to girls on the street. There you go. Right? That's and why then, we do a lot of things. Of right? course we do. <laughs> That's why we do a lot of things. <laughs> Everything, right? If we didn't have women in the world, we'd all be walking around barefoot and just, you know, no teeth, right? Exactly. But, um, <laughs> then I would start going to the Black Expos where there was like a basic flea market on the road. And I would try to sell shirts there. Why? Yeah. 
because girls were there. Right, right. But also, we started. We were really passionate about what we were doing, right. and and we started getting that high when we sold stuff at a Black Expo, you know, and then we'd go to another one and we see somebody wearing it. I go, wow, that's pretty cool. And that's when they came back and started saying. Man, you know, I tell everybody about this shirt, and they ask me for it, so I need to buy three now because I got to buy it for everybody. And we start saying, wow. Right? And it just became so uh, exciting. I, I would have normally paid to go to the Black Expo right. to go around and buy stuff or see stuff. And then, you know, we happen to live in Hollis, Queens. There's a lot of music artists in Hollis, Queens. You know, obviously, uh, Salt and Pepper, Run DMC, LL Cool J, Tribal Quest. A lot of them come from there. We didn't really know them, but we knew all their friends. Uh -huh. But then all of a sudden, we heard, we, we were saying, well, can we get something in a video? And they would go, yeah, come on down. And we go down to the video, and there's craft services. It's free to eat as right. much food as you want. You get to see somebody like LL Cool J performing a song. There's video vixens running around. Girls everywhere. I would have paid to go there. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead, put on a shirt. And they put right. on a shirt, and I, then I'd say, man, I don't have any money to uh, have a small company, so I really can't afford to lose that shirt. Can I have it back? Really? Yeah. And they you would give it back. it back. And they would give it back, yeah. Wow. There's only one rapper who never gave um, the shirt back to me. Old Dirty Bastard, of course. <laughs> Scalability was very hard because it was how do I go and finance and, and, and underwrite, you know, these things, you know, where, where will I get the capital, how, what's the turnaround time, and I didn't have any financial intelligence at the time, right. so, you know, my journey. You could sell, you could hustle. And I could sell, out. I could hustle, but, you know, my journey, I, I, I almost failed or, and lost everything several times. Uh, throughout that journey because I just didn't know how to use the tool of money and um, and and it's so hard to try to acquire all that knowledge within the same time how do I acquire the knowledge of branding marketing distribution manufacturing warehousing shipping financial customer intelligence support, customer yeah, yeah. support you know return on goods you know consumption you know what I mean it, it's so hard so of course I had to start leveraging as well and creating a bunch of strategic relationships because I knew I needed that. I knew I needed that because, you know, listen, you know, when you tell somebody to stop smoking, you know, a couple of times and, and, and after the 10th time, they know they they already have a problem with smoking. They don't want to listen to you. Listen, forget it. I'm not even going to address it. I'm going to start smoking. When you have a business, you have to answer the call or yeah. you're closed. Right. Right. So you have to plug the dam. And I knew I had to plug the dam. So I started just creating a lot of strategic relationships, and that's actually the power of broke. Mm -hmm. Because it is the fact that, you know, if I would have had money, when I went to those video sets, I would have paid the director, I would have paid the producer, I would have paid the, the, the rapper, everybody yeah. else, right? I'd have, if you gave me uh, $20,000 at that time, and I heard that LL Cool J will wear my stuff for $5,000, and the director wants $5,000 to wear it, they're getting the money. Of course. Right? Yeah. And they're going to wear it. But I got into 30, 40 videos with $0, right? Because I had no way to do it, and I had nothing to lose. You couldn't take anything from me. I didn't have right. anything. Yeah. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so, so You couldn't even give me your shirt. Right. You took it back. <laughs> I, I took it back, right? And I said, I got you later. Yeah, right? right, old dirty best said, "You got me now." But <laughs> uh, you know, when, when you have, when you, when you, when you're working with the power of broke, it does a couple of things. Number one, it makes sure that you learn the process yourself. You can't afford to hire anybody else. So all those people out there who who pay forty thousand dollars for a website when it really costs five, right? Right? Or you, you can leverage it by bartering or something. Whatever yeah. the case yeah. is, right? So you have to learn the process. And what happens during that? period of time of learning the process is that when and if and hopefully you get to the point that you are successful nobody can tell you lies you can't have somebody say well I'm not going to tell you about shipping because you know you're firing me and I got to go work it out yourself I said get the hell out of the way I've been doing this for eight years myself right <laughs> yeah, yeah. you you know you, you you get and you learn the process number one number two is because you don't have a lot of capital you focus on the only thing that you can do. You don't drown an opportunity. You don't take a bunch of money and go, oh, we should try a bunch of stuff. Here right. you go. Here's 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 here. Go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you go, 
All right, what are we going to do with this hat right now? You know, so that's the process. And that process is very, very important. Also, you learn and it brings out the character of who you have around you when you operate the power of broke. What do you mean by that? Well, if you if you if you're busy, let's open a business today. Let's go take a 10,000, let's go take a $100,000 loan. Well, what happens when the money goes away? Because when I didn't have anything, people worked with me for free. And I, I saw who rose to the challenge. I saw who jumped ship. Right. I saw who was problem solvers and problem creators. And and that's the process of activating the power broke. Because to tell you the truth, the, the people who activate, activate the power broke more than anybody else are the people who are successful. Because that's how they stay successful. Would you say that those individuals have a powerful vision and then a really great at enrolling others in that vision? Is that they, the key ingredient or well, in, well, first, getting the team to do it essentially for... Absolutely. But it's not that they have a powerful vision and they've enrolled in everybody in the vision, but there's no reason for everybody who is enrolling into it to jump on a sinking ship or a bad idea. You see, we're going to get A on our report card. Sometimes we're going to get an F. So if my power broke concept, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm creating FUBU, they didn't wear it because I was giving the shirts away. They wore it because they had to dig in their pocket and they had to pull out their hard-earned money and buy it. Now, if you go out and you give 100 shirts away to all your friends and family, even if it's the nastiest looking shirt, someone's going to feel bad for you, usually your mother, right. and they're going to come to you and say, boy, son. I wore this at the store and they loved my shirt, <laughs> right? Because yeah. that's mom. Yeah, right. Go try to sell that shirt to 100 people who couldn't give a crap about you. Right. Who got to dig in their <laughs> pocket for $10. <laughs> you want to get a, 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 you want to get a, what do you call it? A, a focus group? Yeah, yeah. Try going to Harlem like I used to and, and selling sell shirts on and the tell streets. <laughs> on the streets. Oh, they're going to give you the focus group for free. <laughs> exactly. They're going to love it or not. So would you say the power broke is more of a mindset or a way of being? What do you think? It is a mindset. It is an absolute mindset. It, it is a way to think and it is a way to know that, um, listen, if you really think about it, well, I can't come up with anything. I can't come up with any time, anything of substance in my life. Relationship, whether it's personal relationship with family, friends, loved ones, you know, uh, that money ever was the reason the relationship worked. It never was. It was always a byproduct on a working relationship. Mm. You know, it's like you're going out and getting a dating a hot girl, right? Your first day, you, hey, how you doing? Pull up to her in a Bentley. Next day, buying her roses. Next day, buying her uh, everything, right? Jewelry, hey, jewelry all the time, right? A month later, you lose your, your job or you got sued for a billion dollars or whatever and you lost everything she's probably gonna be like well, well i'm so used to roses what right. happened you know but and i'm not saying that just about women or, or men but sure, sure. but it, if, if things are built on a on a poor foundation there's nothing there. right, right. so when it, you have the funds yeah exactly so it it takes an average of 60 to seventy five thousand dollars to create a clothing line a first sample clothing line. It takes about nine months to to get it fully done. How many samples? Like one sample? Uh, or like you know, a, a line of let's say twenty-four pieces. Okay. Um, it, it, I'm sorry, if you're paying a designer, you're not doing it yourself. I would say one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's gotcha. right. I don't do that. So if I have something great logo, whatever the case is, I will go and get a tailor to maybe sew up four pieces and average about fifteen hundred dollars. Then I go and find an Instagram star or a video if I could. I give them a thousand, a thousand, maybe three thousand. I put this stuff out and I go and watch the phone. Anybody calling? Anybody calling? Anybody <laughs> Anyone calling? want this? All right, you liked it. You liked it. All right, let's let's do another shirt. Right. Nobody calling. We're good. Cut bait. Sure. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Right. I can put out a book called uh, you know Power Broke and I can hire a lot of great publicists and take out ads and everything mm -hmm. else like that mm -hmm. or i can schedule nine times reschedule nine times with you to come over here mm -hmm. and beg you to be on your podcast <laughs> and call another uh 10 guys like you uh you know adam corral and all these people yeah, yeah. 
and 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 go out there and bust my butt and use the power broke myself and send it out to 100 ambassadors call them personally and say hey what do you think about any changes what can i do for you yeah. stop over the store and start just signing out of nowhere i just pull up in a barnes and noble and just start signing like crazy i have to activate the power broke because right. you know what happens when you have a sales staff and people the number one person they're selling is you on how good of a job they're doing and how maybe you didn't give them the right materials. Sure. This absolutely Mindset. is something that everybody can learn and that's why in the book, I don't want people to think that I have, uh, you know, I have this magical touch, this secret right. sauce. And that's why as you see in there, there are many people that you and I know that I've interviewed and I've learned from in that book 15 over 15 people that have um, have accomplished massive success in their life you right. know I love talking about the people. Rob Durdak as you say yeah, yeah. started off as a skateboarder yeah. no money at all uh, uh, Kevin Plank the CEO yeah. of Under Armour four billion dollars annual sales didn't have enough money to pay a toll uh, when he started his company so they wrote him a ticket at the toll booth or, or Mark Burnett, the head of my show, right? AB, uh, ABC Shark Tank. The man was a special forces or one of those type of things in, uh, in, 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 the, in the military in Europe. He comes over here, first job, a nanny. Wow. He was a nanny. Second job, selling t-shirts on Venice Beach, right? Or let's look at, I always joke about it because I put up a post about um, Steve Ioki. Say, oh, the, the operation of power broke. Everybody hit me. You know, everybody judges things without reading. Steve Aoki's dad had um, Benny Hanna's. He was rich. Yeah, well, that actually hurt him because when he went to the, the hood to play music and be down with the click, the keep it real artist guys, they were like, take your rich butt home. <laughs> Don't come around here, little rich boy. Yeah. Then when he went to dad and said, I need some money to do this and that, dad said, what are you doing? I came to this country with nothing. And if you don't work in this company with me, I'm not giving you a dime. So yeah. stop spinning those stupid little records. Now the man does $30 million a year and he's the most touring DJ in the world. You know, and, and <clears throat> I don't. So first of all, let me let me be very clear, and I've had to make sure that I, I want to acknowledge one thing. I'm not glamorizing not having resources in your life, right? Right? Because we all want to be able to take care of our family and have medical and right. and and have the things and an education, right. things like that. So that's why people go on Shark Tank. Exactly. Right. To get resources. Ex exactly. So do not get me. Don't make me say, "Oh, so I'm supposed to feel good about not having any money." <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Sure. But make that hunger, if you're going to yes. be there, tap into that hunger instead of, instead of complaining or feeling sorry or thinking that something needs to happen, right? Yeah, so, yeah I was just going to say it's more of an exercise of hustling, essentially, and using that hunger as opposed to let me just throw everything I have at it and see what works. Right. Yes. And as I go through all those people, I want to show you that there's no one way to go to your, get to the level that you consider successful, but... With this day and age of social media and technology, where there is no uh, barrier to entry anymore of meeting and getting out to yeah. people, you can have what we call a proof of concept and test your idea. So I go through there step by step on what to do. So, so now in any business, no matter what, you need to have a proof of concept, yeah. meaning, hey, I may think that my cupcakes are tasty, but let me see how many people buy them. Yeah. Now. If you can't even make a cupcake, I'm sure you can film a 30 second video on your phone and tell of you making it or telling people about it. And you can get proof of concept if you have 10,000 people views your video. Right. Whatever, likes, whatever the case is, right? And then you take that and then improve on it and improve on it and start and start the process, right? Before it wasn't that easy necessarily. Right. You know, before when I made a shirt, I had to go and either sell it on the corner, sell it to somebody, and then I had to find the person the next day to sell it to them again. Um, and then, or if I sold it to the store, who would they sell it to? Who walked by and pick it up? Unless I'm gonna sit in the store all day. See. Yeah, who, yeah. Was it a woman? Was it a man? Was it a kid? Did they buy it for themselves? Was it a gift? Did they buy it to wash their car with? I, I have no idea. Did they haggle over the price? Now, you know. You're on the computer, you go, boop, oh, somebody bought it, it, oh, yeah, uh, it's an 18-year-old kid, lives in California, exactly. loves a skateboard, has a pit bull, and has a bad case of dandruff. <laughs> exactly.
Exactly. Right? And so, so this is where we are today. So you can test your concepts very, very easily, and you can then be more equipped to go out to the world. And you'll find funding. There's so many ways of getting funding now. Very, very hard to say because there were so many. Right. And, and, I, and I truthfully, uh, the person who learns the most from Shark Tank, uh, whether the viewers or anybody else is me. Mm -hmm. I learn from, I joke about the other sharks, but all, all joke inside, I learn from them. And I learn from these young men and women who are coming up here and they're doing business an entire new way. Yeah. And um, there's some in the book, there's one or two in the book, but you know, let me let me think of others. I mean, there was this young lady I did a, mo a deal with for, uh, it's called uh, Fresh uh, Picked Moccasins, Leather Moccasins. She went and I believe she, she took aluminum frame windows and I think she went and melted down solo aluminum to make one pair of moccasins and then so more and then made another pair of moccasins and now she's doing you know a couple of, a couple of million dollars or little Mo he's in the book little Mo bridges you know he came on the show young man very laser focused on making bow ties him and his mother and I, I looked at them and, and remembered and they remind me of my relationship with my mother and he was going to do a deal and takes Kevin O'Leary's offer, which is not wrong because he came on the show to ask for, for, for capital and resources, and Kevin O'Leary stepped up to the plate. But I, I told him that if he would have taken that $30,000, you know, if I would have taken that back then with the FUBU days, it would have been worth a couple hundred million dollars, right, because of, uh, you know, the percentage. So he, he decided to decline the deal. I became his mentor. And honestly, I barely helped the kid. He helps me more than I help him because... <laughs> I, I turn on TV, he's the fashion correspondent on the NBA yeah. draft, right? Wow. Doing about $300,000 in business. I go and I take him on to CNBC one day because I say, hey, I want to introduce you to Mo, and I want to take Mo out to Fashion Week in New York. Uh, um, oh, shoot. What did I, what's, the <laughs> name, what's the name of the big, big retailer in Dallas? That uh, Neiman Marcus, the CEO of Neiman, Marcus, the one of the highest retail outlets right. in the world, calls the show, and I've never been in Neiman Marcus, and I pick up the phone. Yeah, how can I help you? You know, you want my Kooji brand and all that. And she's like, uh, let me speak to Mo. <laughs> it, all wow. my life, I've never talked to this person. She wanted to speak to Mo. Wow, so amazing, very inspiring. I read my goals. I read my goals not every day, but I read them five days a week. I read them in the morning be, uh, when I wake up, and I read them at night uh, before I go to sleep. I have uh, nine goals that range from um, uh, business to health to family. Uh, six of them uh, expire every six months. And, really? Yeah, and two of them, um, uh, sorry, six of them expire in six months. Two of them expire in uh, five years, and one expires in 20. Um, oh. And uh, you know they're they're very very detailed in in what they are and the reason is I just want I want to read I want I want them to be the last thing I, I think about when I go to bed huh. and um, I reset them every six months um, but I notice that as the date comes up I start to have this um, anxiety <laughs> all right and if you haven't achieved it yet yeah if you haven't achieved it and, <laughs> and most of them you're not going to achieve if you really set aggressive ones right. but. You're going to get their 50, 60, 70 it, percent, right? yeah. bang, then reset it for a longer period of time with another, a higher a goal to reach. Uh, the third time it settled in, the third time, I, I read this book the first time when I was 16. The third time I read the book, I was 19. I read the book every year, Think and Grow Rich. It's a great book. Yeah. But doing course. a documentary right now, did they approach you? No, they didn't. I mean, they sent me some um, leather bags, some really special sure, sure. ones. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they uh, maybe they don't know how to get a hold of me. It's pretty uh, hard. Well, if you want, let me know. They, yeah. They reached out to me to do it. I, so. I would love it. Yeah. Um, it's a great book. Absolutely. Got a couple of them up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so many editions. Uh, yeah. You know, if we can only be so lucky to be like <laughs> like like Napoleon Hill, right? It's amazing. Um. So 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 that that's where it is, and the ritual is pretty simple. It's it's you know. 
um, if I say, hey, I need to, I need to lose X amount of pounds, uh, you know, by this date, I'm going to, and then what's the process? Well, I'm going to drink six bottles of water. I'm going to drink one green drink a day. I'm going to do cardio in the morning. And if I can slip in some weight training at night, I'm not going to eat out to 7 p.m. I'm not going to eat fried foods and or meat. And in return for that, I will be healthier and I will be able to live a longer, prosperous life and be in my daughter's lives longer and to make sure that I'm there for them. Mm -hmm. and so, you, you know, what is the goal? How are you going to get to that point? When does it expire? Yep. You know, and what do you, what is the reward for the goal? Time frame I pick. So I, I think six months is a reasonable time to accomplish something and or say to yourself, what's wrong with you? You've been talking this crap for six <laughs> months, right? I think that also in six months you can see the change because yeah. if I sit there every morning and I sit there and say I'm going to have a green drink or a banana for breakfast, then that's one less time that I'm going to have that everything bagel with sour cream and mm, salmon and all that stuff. Right. And by you know by the time the six months go, I've probably done that 40 times, 90 times, and you start to see the difference in what it is. So. And the five-year one, I want to be somewhere in, you know, what are, what are we going to do in five years? I don't know. And then 20-year one is always going to be about that kind of, as you look over, as I look over my family and my health the and legacy. You know, my legacy to some extent. And hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'm going to have to reset the 20 one, right. the 20 sure, year, sure, year. Sure. Yeah, with you one a little bit the the, the losing weight yeah, yeah. one when I get back into my training mode that's what I am uh, right. that's what I do. Um, do you have a specific weight you want to get at? I, I I always I always well usually <laughs> when I when I shoot Shark Tank I'm always at one sixty eight. Um, Why one sixty eight? Is that just the way you are? That's just the way my body works. Right, <laughs> yeah. I get to one sixty eight, and then when I'm off season. I usually get up to about 185 during the winter, and then if it's a, if I'm really, really like uh, traveling too much, can't do it, I can get as high as 193. Yeah, you like to hibernate. You like no, to you know what? It's just being on the it's just being on the road, bad yeah, sleeping habits. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's, tough, um, and it's just hard. I'm sure this book launch is not helping you either. Ah, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> oh. It's gonna be it's gonna be getting up, and it's gonna be um. It's answering emails. I mean, yeah. you know, honestly, because you want to. Oh, so many opportunities. You want to? No, you no. You just want to get them out of the way before you get to the <laughs> office, because you're never going to get to them after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my next book is probably going to be called Death by Email. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure, sure. I don't know. <laughs> These emails, man, kill me. Uh, the billionaires I've seen, they. First of all, I'm. Not saying it because of the book, but the, they act, they they use the power broke. The power bro. Sure. They sure. they'll spend a billion dollars on a party because that's a party, but they're very disciplined and they won't mm. spend that on launching a company. They will they will act like they don't have anything. Mm. Uh, what a mentality. Number one. Number two is they write down everything really they write down everything um you know we got into this day and age where uh people are typing in their smartphones they physically write down everything and i remember one of them said to me uh the dullest pencil will always remember more than the sharpest mind which is a very 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 well-known quote and usually what they write i noticed that they write uh how to save the most on taxes really yeah, they usually write that because tax codes change often, right? And investments have certain tax benefits or not, whether philanthropy or whatever the case is. And I and 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 they pr they look at it like this. They go, "Well, I can either start, I, I, I I'm, you know, putting in my pocket uh, two hundred million a year, argument sake." I can either go and start a new business, right, that I need to go and, um, you know, and maybe I'll get up to 100 million, 200 million, and I pay taxes on it, or how do I save on that 40 or 30% of taxes that I'm going to have to pay away because I already have the money. Why, right. why lose it? And they concentrate on that all the time, and, wow. they, and they're looking at, you know, everything. And then, and then the last thing is when I've always talked to them, um, when we have conversations, they think purely on a global scale. 
they'll you know we'll sit there and say how many um, how many people can I get to to walk by my uh, my my plumber's uh, you know my service place you know in in um in Manhattan on the street and they'll sit there and say how many cars are in the world they're really thinking like that yeah. they're like how many cars are in the world hmm, how much have an exhaust comes out of them Most exhaust pipe carry the four nine that's how they are um whew, very very tough you know i'm i'm mentored by really amazing people <laughs> you know jay abraham oh, he's a brilliant marketing uh, guy you know so many really amazing people uh, i i i don't have a mentor you know maybe i met him once or twice richard branson i think the reason why is because he said something pretty fascinating. I didn't know Richard Branson is dyslexic like I am. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. Nah, I'm couldn't couldn't really I'm read saying. it all growing up. I'm saying, I'm <laughs> saying, four out of the six sharks are dyslexic. Wow. Um, Richard Branson is dyslexic, and he also somebody who, because I used to always say to myself, should I really focus on making Fubu Nike and try to go there and set my goals for that? Or am I too close to it? And Richard Branson has 300 companies. And he said he's an entrepreneur that gets bored fairly quickly. And he loves the process of new companies, bringing the fundamentals of what he knows over to a new process and the discovery of that. And as I looked at myself and I said, yeah, I have Google. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I'm amazing. But I have 10 other clothing brands. And now I'm going to start thinking I love this, 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 this. I love the, I'm dyslexic. I love the process. And um, I, I think that uh, we have a, I, I just, when I heard him speak, um, we just, I just realized I have so much in common with that guy. Why haven't you reached out to get the mentorship yet? Well, because first of all, um, I also do believe in mentorship that you should be uh, with somebody who's extremely accessible. I don't know if he's accessible, but I know one thing. I'm not accessible because I'm so busy. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want the guy to get the time to yeah. get it. Hey, man, wanted. I'll be the mentorship. And I'll be like, yes. yeah, I'll schedule you. Uh, <laughs> Six months. And he'll be like, well, didn't you just ask me for a favor? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why are you so pushy? You know what I mean? <laughs> time is time, baby. I love that. I love that. You know, so. Um, mm, um, I would think Jay Abraham has been. Yeah, really? Yeah. yeah, because, you know. It's, no, it's really no, in no. Terms of, in terms of scaling, or very hard, very hard. Uh, really, all of them. I I can't say that any any yeah. one person uh, helped me more than the other. I can't say any one person didn't have the knowledge. My mother helped me in the beginning. My sure. my stepfather Steve, and then my amazing partners over at Fubu. You know, I have uh, my three, you know, f friends who've been there all all my life for me. They've helped me when the times are tough, and I've learned from them. And then our other partners over on the other side of the food. So, I don't know. Um, and it's yeah, great. Yeah. It, amazing. Uh, the thing to turn me off is the fact that they don't have proof of concept. They just uh, they just think it's a good idea. And it's, and it's my job to help you create the proof of concept. So you're too lazy to do it. By the way, um, I have 100 ideas in my head, too, that I can own 100% uh, of. Yeah, so yeah. why? One. Number two so is get a proof of concept. A proof of concept. Show right? that if, there's a buzz. Yeah, something. if you don't have proof of concept, and they go, well, I, I don't know how to get it started. Well, then that's what you're going to be telling me when, when, when it is started, and you not, you don't know how to take it to the next step. I got my own headaches. Leave me alone. Yeah, exactly. The next one is, um, well, this is a fifty billion dollar market, and if I only get one percent, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> The bankruptcy market is a trillion dollar market, and I promise you're going to get 1% with that attitude. Right. Um, okay. Those are the things that turn me off. Uh, the things that uh, get me excited are I tried this and I failed. I tried this and I failed. I tried this and I failed. And then I finally, bang, found out the best way to do this. And I found out because all these other things that I failed at doing in, in, in this area this one i knew i was on to something yeah. somebody who's willing to admit their failure because any successful entrepreneur knows that you are going to fail more than you yeah. succeed 
right that one of course that's it and then the other one is proof of concept right that's it you know you have the the right to make up your own opinion but not the right to make up your own facts right so and you see that happen all the time kevin yes. o'leary will go yeah how many uh how many how many did you sell that stupid thing right there and they're like one million dollars he's like you're not too stupid now right right he's like oh sales cures sell. all right yeah. you are not looking too yeah. stupid now yeah, exactly all of a sudden there's a halo over that person's head have an interest in it 100 percent. i have to have an interest because you know what if i don't have a full interest in it maybe i'm a customer right and and you know listen you know the power broke theory is don't spread yourself to thin. you can't do every single thing in the world and people think because i have access to capital that people like us just walk around and buy everything no. hey how you doing oh I, I like that locker i want to invest in the company <laughs> no no no, man, you, you won't have time for that because in, investing is the, it, you then got to answer the phone call every time. Yeah. And so, you know, <laughs> I get all the time on Shark Tank, oh, that person had some great idea. Why didn't you invest in the company? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I look at, um, besides my companies, I really look at, it takes me about, it takes about six months out of my, my life, all the investments. And I have really, here. yeah, and I have really, really amazing partners that allow uh, my businesses to run. And um, and again, you know, I could probably do more business in my business if I do. But these other opportunities that I'm in, whether I win or lose, they're teaching me about an entire new way of doing business. If I wasn't on Shark Tank, or if I didn't do investments like made in CrossFit. I would never have an insight on the new way that the world is operating. I would have still been the Fugu guy going, hey, uh, you know, JC Penney's or Macy's, or please buy my shirt. Hey, how you doing on social media? I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Uh, you know, and, and I'd have been at the mercy of everybody else. On top of this. Oh yeah, listen up. Trust me, you and I doing the podcast. I'm not trying to make it a big wet kiss. Sure, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm fine with that. I want to make sure that yeah, yeah. I didn't put in the book or I did put in the book, and, and whether I did or not. The, the advice that I would give the younger Damon John is make sure you have financial intelligence. Mm. I don't care even you're going to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur working for a company, whatever the case is. I don't care if you have money or you don't have money. Money is so hard to make and it's 10 times harder to keep and it's a tool. And I almost lost too many times because I was so eager to make the money and I didn't have financial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And many people say, well, Damon, you didn't go to school or college and should I? And uh, the fundamentals of business are the fundamentals of business. And you need to go and study finance no matter what. And a perfect example of that is all the all the athletes that three years out of the league, over 60% of them are broke, right? Yeah. How the Powerball people, some of them are going to be broke yeah. fairly quickly, three years, right? And it's because just... You know, if you really look at an anatomy of a bankruptcy or something that, like, you know, if you and I, if I had, you know, $300,000, I'm going to probably buy a $50,000 house. I'm going to buy a little car for $20,000, whatever the case is. If an athlete has $50 million, they're going to buy a $7 million house. Right. And they're going to buy a bunch of cars. But it's the same house. Yeah. It's just a bigger bill. Yeah. And, you know, they're not going to understand about compounding interest and all, all the things that they need to do in life to make it because money is just a tool. I think that I haven't read it yet. Everybody's talking really amazing about Tony Robbins' great book, new book, Master right? of the Game. Yeah, Money yeah. Master of the Game. Okay. Yeah. I haven't read that. And again, dyslexic. I uh, yeah. So I'm sure you listen to the audio book yeah. probably. All right. <laughs> I got to get the audio book. Um, of course, you know, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. I know. No, not Think. Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. Okay. Rich Dad Poor Dad. It, it's, uh, it, it's a staple for a reason. What am I most grateful for recently in my life? Um, you know, in, in, my, in my personal life, I'm grateful that everybody uh, has their health. I haven't had any, um, any loss. You know, I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of loss in my life, 
growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Yeah. And whether people were incarcerated or they lost their lives at a very early age due to violence or drugs. And that, uh, you know, hasn't been an issue with anybody in, in my life. So and I know it's inevitable, right? right. And so, so that's what happened. So I think, I think on that on a personal issue. Um, on a, recently on a business tip, um, I don't know, you know, of course, my appointment to the White House, I never thought I would be meeting and sitting with the president. I've met the last three presidents of this great country. Wow. And who would ever thought that, right? right. Um, so business-wise, I would say that is one of them. And then another really great year of Shark Tank. For the reason, though, that when I see that it's, it's one of the top shows watching kids 5 to 15 and one of the top shows watch parents and kids together. And when I see people come up to me and say, you know what, my daughter wants to be a, she wants to open, be a shark as much as she stopped caring about being an actress, a singer, and a dancer, or, you know, an athlete, nothing wrong with that. Um, she wants to be a shark. Or when a mother comes to me and says, my son finally came to me and said, mommy, I know what you do now at work. You know, when, when you when you see that or people say, I decided to start a business and I'm empowering myself. And you see that a show like that, that everybody said would never work, got almost canceled, um, you know, seven years in and people are religiously following it. When you see us changing lives, that's that's I mean, that's why Mark Cuban does it. People always wonder, why does Mark Cuban do it? He don't, he don't need investments, right? He, he doesn't need any more TV time. You always see him on basketball, show, right? He does it because it's, it's, it's really empowering. As you, what am I talking about? You, I mean, this is what you do. You yeah. empower people, and, and it's, it's just amazing. It's always going to be health-related. Mm. It's always going to be why has um, uh, God has really, really blessed me for too long. Right, you know, I was a kid, I was hanging out, I don't know how many times I was doing things that kids do, right? Yeah. And um, why am I still just cranking along, <laughs> right? You know, I'm sure. almost 50 years old right now, right? And um, still a young man, yeah, yeah, I am, but I again, I've seen people yeah. not because of now I'm talking about violence or anything else like that, I've seen people just curl over and have a heart attack. Yeah. I mean, I know last year, I think I I think I remember counting within three months, 11 people that passed away un, they, and, and, and they did not realize it, whether it was unfortunately. In the beginning of the book, I dedicate something to uh, my, my venture capitalist who's an amazing man named David Freshman. He's the one that all my Shark Tank people had to, once, they, once we did the deal, they had to vet the deal with David, right? And David truly believed in entrepreneurship ever since from day one. And he he's always somebody who, was a venture capitalist, but one who taught kids and people of color on how to get into this business, and amazing guy. You know, he called me and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to fight the biggest battle of my life, you know, right now, and I found out I have pancreatic cancer, and within, you know, very short time, you know, he, he's no longer with us. Wow. And I met about, I, I know about 11 people that faced that last year, so you never know when we're gonna be Never you know, know, when the good man's going to call for us, moment, you know, yeah. and hopefully Dave is down here protecting me. Now Now he's my Seriously. ultimate venture capitalist protector. 